Um, that's recording. Um, oh. That's it. There we go. Sorry about that. Excellent. on the slides. Okay, I'm gonna talk in the microphone like because we're recording it. So even though there's like three of you here. So thank you for coming. Um, so we are gonna record this. We'll post this, um, the uh, um, the Zoom meeting, uh, probably on my YouTube channel. Um, and we'll send out the link to that. So if you wanna review that stuff later. So um, anyway, um, I'm Professor Brian Stokes. Um, I'm the cluster leader for computer and information science. And this is Robert Fleming. He is our security manager for uh, ITS. And so because this is a Security Awareness Month, October, we wanted to um, kind of do a little presentation and talk about some things that people should be aware of uh, when it comes to security. So, um, so Cybersecurity Awareness Month has been around for, um, I'm trying to think when they started it, probably close to 20 years ago, something like that. It's been a while that they've, uh, they've been doing this. So every October is Cybersecurity Awareness Month, just to raise awareness of security issues that are all around us. Um, and so that's why we decided to do it to uh, do a presentation this month. So, um, so what we're going to do as we go through this is we're just going to talk about some potential threats that are out there. Um, and the the thing that is really important is this what uh, so what part, like so what. And I get this a lot when I'm teaching classes. I get a lot of students when we talk about things like keeping your information private. And every once in a while, a student will be like, "So what? Who cares if I get my information?" Um, it matters because that information can be used to leverage other types of uh, activities. For example, if I get enough information about you, I could create a fake ID with your information, apply for a loan or a credit card. Um, I could steal your information and possibly log into your bank account, something like that. So it matters because we need to protect our information. Um, so we're going to talk about some common sense. Um, and that's the thing, too. A, a, a lot of this is very common sense. Um, things like we'll talk about like <clears throat> passwords and multi-factor authentication. What are all those things and how can I, you know, protect myself? Yep. And then we'll talk about some commonly used terms. So when you see that in the news, you understand if you're not familiar with this stuff, what they're talking about. Okay. Okay. So um, this is kind of a scary statistic. 5.2 billion internet users or 63% of the world population. Um, and where do you think most of that's uh, um, located? Um, primarily America, Asia, Europe. Um, there's not a lot of uh, users in what you consider like third world countries. But what's interesting is, um, again, in my ethics class, we talk about the fact that there are people in third world countries who don't have access to electricity or clean water, but have cell phones. So it's amazing how um, common technology has become. Uh, you know, can you imagine, and this is a question I ask my students too, can you imagine applying for a job if you didn't have a smartphone or a computer. Most businesses require you to go online to apply. There's no more paper applications. And so that's why technology is really important, but it's also important to understand some safety measures as well. Yep. Okay. Um, so we're gonna talk about uh, cybercrime. Um, you wanna talk about this? This is kind of your sure. area? Yep, absolutely. So cybercrime is any crime which is committed electronically. Um, this can include theft, fraud, sometimes uh, on the dark web, people will be hired for murder. Um, examples, and the biggest one to me when I think of cybercrime is identity theft. Um, a lot of times when we think of cybercrime, um, stealing your information and impersonating you is what they're generally trying to do. And that kind of goes along with the financial theft. Um, they'll attempt to steal intellectual property. Um, malware is considered cybercrime. Ransomware attacks, that's all that all falls under cybercrime. Um, why should you care? Uh, cybercrime is dangerous. It, you know, 
online and off. Um, cyber defense basics can go a long way with keeping you and your data out of the hands of bad actors. Um, so anybody that's looking to steal your data, um, and another term that we'll use in this presentation is malicious actors. And I do want to point out something too. So we've got this stuff going over here. This is some scary stuff, you know, identity theft, sex abuse, you know, uh, trafficking, uh, financial theft. Um, if you watch TV, if you watch, let's see, Law and Order or CSI or anything like that, you think like this is happening everywhere. Um, it's a small minority of people that are doing this, but the, the problem is they're very good at it. Um, especially there's a lot of threat actors that uh, live outside the US. Yep. Um, in uh, China, any any kind of country that we don't have good uh, extradition rights with, yep. China, Iran, Russia, those countries will harbor these criminals and basically let them do what they want to because they know that we'll never be able to extradite them to the U.S. And so it's not, you know, it's not like 50 percent of the users on the Internet are, are committing crimes. It's like I said, a small percentage, but the crimes they commit can be very, very expensive. So millions or even billions of dollars in loss because of what they're doing. So, so that's, keep that in mind. Um, I I've, I've, have a couple of students right now. Again, I'm teaching an ethics, you know, cyber ethics class this semester, and they talk about that. I've seen in their, their comments, there's one person I think is so paranoid, I'm, I'm surprised they're actually online um, because they're so afraid that they're gonna get hacked. Um, and that's not really, as long as you're taking simple steps, it's not gonna happen, so. Um, okay, so uh, I'll let you talk about yep. uh, malware. So malware is any software that's designed to do damage, steal data, um, limit your ability to access your own data. Um, it can give somebody unauthorized access or remote access to your devices. Um, anything that's connected to the internet effectively can be susceptible to malware. And it, not even necessarily you know, online. Um, we'll go into physical attacks after this. But some examples of malware are ransomware, adware, Botnets, rootkits, spyware, viruses, worms. Um, a lot of things that, you know, if you've been on the internet for the past 15, 20 years, like you've heard of these terms. And I think it's important to, to point out, how does this stuff happen? How do I get, so it talks about why should you care? How do most people get infected? Uh, to me? Yeah. Most thing I, the phishing emails. Right. So phishing, like they'll send you um, malicious email, it looks legitimate, and that's basically their entry point um, to move through your system. Right. So you get an unsolicited email from somebody, it's got an attachment, you open the attachment, bam, you're infected. Um, and they use that a lot in businesses as well. So they'll send out like from HR, it'll have like an attachment supposedly, supposedly is like an Excel spreadsheet with salary information. Ooh, I can see what everyone's making. You open it up and boom, you're infected. So um, and I think the one thing, again, the common sense thing is check it. If you're not expecting it, like you get this unsolicited email with an attachment, and you're not sure who it is um, or why you got it, pick up the phone. Yep. Yeah, you know? call help desk. Yeah. Say, hey, I got this email. I'm not sure if this is legit. Or call the person that supposedly sent it to you. We've had that happen in the past where students have uh, gotten their email compromised and suddenly you get an email saying, here's this business opportunity, reply to this Gmail account and pick up the phone, you know, or send an email, you know, just do something simple, double check. Um, that's the biggest problem, I think, is a lot of these, when you read about these uh, uh, um, attacks that have happened, is somebody wasn't thinking, and they opened the email, and they opened the attachment, and they got infected and didn't even realize it. And so just stop and think, does it make sense that I got this email? Why are they sending it to me? Should I open it? And just double check. So. If it doesn't feel right, chances are it's not, you know, legitimate email. Um, a lot of times, you know, what Brian was talking about with when you open an email and it redirects you to sign in, that we see a lot of that. So basically they're looking to do credential phishing. You know, it takes you to a link where it looks like a legitimate sign in page. You attempt to sign in, but your credentials, because it was illegitimate, are sent off to the malicious actor where they attempt to get into your email and leverage your email because you're trusted to people in your um, contact list. And they're attempting to leverage your email to send more emails out to do exactly the same thing, rinse and repeat. Yeah, so that's that's probably the ultimate uh, um, guidance is stop and think. Um, a lot of times people will do something just reacting and not stopping and thinking, that doesn't sound right. Why am I doing this? So yeah, so make sure you do that. 
Okay, um, I guess I'll talk about ransomware. So, so ransomware, um, you may have, I'm sure you've all heard of it. Um, so what exactly happens is, again, we go back to like a phishing email, you open an attachment and that malware package, um, what it will do is it will try to encrypt information on your computer or on the network. Um, so the, the idea is that if I can encrypt your information, you no longer have access to it, you might pay a ransom to get it unlocked. Here's the interesting thing that's been happening in the last couple of years. What they'll do is you'll get an email saying your stuff's locked. If you send us this much money, we'll unlock it. We'll send you the key to unlock it. And that usually was the end of it. Well, now what they'll do is they'll take that information and post it to the dark web. So not only do they get your ransom, but they sell your information. So you're getting what they would do like a double um, a payoff on that. So you have to be very careful when you get, if you get a ransomware attack, um, do I want to pay that ransom? Because you're really just um, continuing to fund the bad guys. Um, and there are some companies that won't. There's company, some companies that say that's not our policy. We're not going to pay the ransom. We're just going to go to like backup or try to crack it or something like that. Okay. Yeah, and technically, <clears throat> um, you know, I think the FBI talks about this. When you pay that ransom, technically speaking, if they're a terrorist organization, um, you've effectively effectively funded, you know, what could be a terrorist organization, um, which could you could be susceptible at that point to legal actions being put against you. Okay. Okay. So prevention, um, we've been talking a lot about like terrible things that can happen, but what are some things that you can do to protect yourself? Um, one of the biggest things is using rep reputable anti-malware software. Um, so, you know, people have their own preference. Uh, some of the big ones, uh, for, especially for windows, windows defender. Um, I, I know it's, in most cases built in, if you upgrade uh, your office subscription, it comes with a higher level of protection. And honestly, Microsoft's been doing a really good job in the anti-malware platform. They've really built it into the core security functionality of Windows. Um, Malwarebytes, that's one that you know I've used for years. They have a really good you know, platform, um, lightweight, quick, and doesn't you know interfere with too much you have going on. Bitdefender's another good one. Um, for the, you know, Ransom, uh, well, for the identity theft portion of things, you know, I think at this point, it's really good to look into identity theft protection, um, things that monitor the dark web, things that monitor your credit. Um, a lot of personal data has already been leaked. And now that it's been leaked, you know, social security numbers, email addresses, passwords, they're on the dark web, they're not coming back. Um, if your information's already been leaked, it's, you know, the best thing that you can do to get ahead of it is having identity theft and dark web monitoring. So, and I would mention too, so you can get things, you probably have seen the commercials about, um, um, what's that company that advertises? LifeLock. LifeLock, yeah. yeah. So you may have seen like that. Yep. But you have the ability of, because of some laws that were passed in terms of uh, um, credit protection, you have the ability to get a copy of your credit file every year for free. Plus, you have the ability of posting a message on there saying that you are a victim of identity theft and to please verify or call you before any kind of credit um, is extended. And you can even put a lock on your credit. That's a little bit extreme because if you ever then try to like go buy a car, you're going to have to unlock everything to be able to get that, you know, get the loan for that. So, but you can put a, a message on there. Um, so I used to work, uh, I was a fraud investigator for Nordstrom uh, for a number of years uh, back in the 90s. And that was one of the things we always recommended that people do is to have that fraud alert placed on their credit files. Um, that would be TransUnion, Equifax, and um, um Experian, thank you, it was TRW at the time, but it's now Experian. That shows how old, how long I've been <laughs> in the field. Um, so you have the ability of going to those three credit files and saying, I want to place a fraud alert on my credit file, and that will slow it down. Um, so that's an idea, too, is, is to prevent it. And then, I don't know if I can say this or not, I don't represent, um, like, as I, I remember when we had our Secret Service agent come out, he couldn't, like, recommend any software. I will tell you the, rec the uh, malware I don't recommend is... Um, I don't like Symantec and I don't like McAfee. They're very big and a lot of computers come pre-installed with one or the other, but they are very bloated. Yep. Um, back in the day, they were great, but over the time, over time, they've gotten more and more bloated and running those actually slows your computer down in some cases. Yeah. So you want something that's lightweight, uh, but has up-to-date um, definition so they can find um, uh, uh, valid uh, um, viruses. Yes. You mentioned that you can get the credit reporting once a year. Is that Three of them a year, one for each year. Yeah, 
Yeah, you can yeah, you can pull from each each of those. So yeah, just go to it's like free credit report dot org or something. Annual like. credit report dot com. Annual credit report dot com. Yeah. So yeah, so I do that every once in a while too. I'll just pull and see. Because the other thing too is you have the ability of disputing anything on there. So if you see an account that you didn't open or you see like your name's misspelled or there's an address you don't recognize, you have the ability to, of disputing that. And unless the, the credit um, file can confirm that after a certain amount of time, they're required to remove that data from your credit file. So that's a good way to protect yourself as well. Okay. So this is a really cool one. Um, is this live or just a screenshot? This is just a screenshot, okay. but I can. Uh, so we talked about data breaches, you know, having emails and passwords, you know, put out there on the dark web. This is a website that you can go to. It's have I been owned or pwned, however you want to say it, um, dot com. And you can search your email address to see if it was part of any of those breaches. Um, I'll give you an example of mine. I go to this website. Never forget. Yeah. You can put in your email address, and unfortunately, Um, you know, this email was part of a data breach at some point. Now, I was fortunate. It, it's only been one so far. Um, but back in 2012, Dropbox had, a, Dropbox had a breach where the email addresses and the um, salted hashes of the passwords were exposed. Um, it, it's not terribly difficult to crack those hashes and convert them into passwords. And if you're using that password on any other you know service um they effectively can use that email and that password to get into you know other other sites so it's really important if you see you know um your email associated with something that comes up on this site and you know again they have tons of breaches and databases that were you know leaked to the dark web um you know change those passwords and follow their their recommendations on that and, and we'll talk about that in a little bit too. I mean, the, the major takeaway from this is do not ever use the same password twice and don't ever use the same password on more than one site. Yep. Um, you have to have a separate password for every account. Now, some people would be like, I can't remember that many passwords. We'll talk about password managers and what you can do to save yourself some time with that. So. Okay. okay, bots. Um, I'll take bots. So, so here's the idea with a bot. So again, we're going back to like a phishing attack. Somebody clicks on a link. The idea behind a botnet is that you have a, uh, a series of computers that have been compromised. Um, and so you, all these computers have um, some kind of malware on them that basically phones home. And so there are what they call bot herders, somebody who's in control of all these bots, and they can do different things. For example, you may have heard like a distributed denial of, of service attack, DDoS attack. So I can tell all of my computers, let's say I have like 100,000 computers that are infected, and I can tell them, I want you to hit amazon.com and just blast it with information. It may, basically makes Amazon unaccessible. Um, and so that's a DDoS attack. The other thing that bots can do is things like grabbing passwords and locking keystrokes. So as you type stuff, it'll gather that information. So there's a lot of people out there that don't even realize that they might have uh, an, an infected computer. When you look at, there's a, there's a, a site you can go to that shows you um, different bots in America. And I'm trying to remember some of the others. Um, I think the U.S. is one of the, uh, usually in the top five in terms of the number of bots. And there's some other countries as well that people don't even realize that their computers are infected. And you can imagine who it is. Like maybe there's an, you know, a, a senior citizen who you know, doesn't know any better and clicks on a link somewhere and their computer gets infected. They have no idea. They maybe check their email once in a while or you know, go online once in a while and they leave their computer running. That computer might be participating in some kind of malicious activity and they have no idea. And yet, it's it's not just limited to computers. IoT devices, um, a, a lot of times routers, uh, they're also susceptible to uh, becoming infected and incorporated into these botnets that uh, cyber criminals will leverage to 
you know, do all sorts of malicious things. Yeah, the, the most famous one was the Mirai botnet, M-I-R-A-I, -I, where they hijacked um, camera controllers. So, you know, you've all, if you've been to Costco or anything like that, they sell like the, you know, um, IP cameras, they have a controller and a bunch of cameras and people would buy those and take them home. Well, they were, they were made by a company very cheaply and, and the software on that, uh, the, those controllers could not be upgraded and the passwords were open. And so somebody figured out a way, hey, I can use that to log into that camera controller and install malware. And so that botnet was a, almost exclusively um, devices that are things like, um, like, you know, if you have like a home, like a Nest device or a camera controller or anything like that, it wasn't even computers that were infected. And that one shut down um, a good portion of what is the DNS network. So that's DNS is like a, the um, phone book for the internet. Uh, so this happened a few years ago, but that was that opened up a lot of people's eyes to, hey, there's these devices out here that have no security on them and can be hijacked to do other malicious activities. And so that kind of woke up a lot of people. So, um, and this is one of the best ways that you can protect yourself is implementing multi-factor authentication. Um, everybody in this room should be familiar with it. We use it at the college. Um, it makes it much more difficult for accounts to be compromised if, even if they have your email address your, and your password and they attempt to sign in, you get a notification, um, which, you know, if, if you're not the one signing in, don't, don't approve that notification. Uh, Multi-factor authentication is a method of using two or more pieces of evidence before successful authentication. Some examples include, obviously, you have your password, but that would be used in combination with an SMS text message. You know, they send you a code in SMS, you type that in. Um, we're starting to move away from that because there have been ways to compromise, you know, or a malicious actor could get, you know, that SMS before you do. Exactly. Um, push notifications to authenticators, My, you know, Microsoft and Google Authenticator, really great for using those rolling codes. Um, and, you know, in some cases, answers to security questions, you know, something that you know. Um, there's three big things when it comes to authentication. Um, what you know, something you have, and something you are, biometrics, you know, like a thumbprint or a base scan. Um, so to give you an example of something you have, this is a security key. Let me open it up. Ugh. There we go. So it's just a USB device, but it has a certificate on it. And so this has to be plugged into your computer in order to unlock the computer. So that's an idea of something you would have. Um, you may have also seen some companies uh, distribute the um, those little uh, those, like little pagers. They they do a, they set out a number, and every sixty seconds the number changes. Um, that's another option. Yeah, that's what I have. I have an RSA. There you go. You have the RSA tokens. Yeah. Oh, it changes. So those are just something that you have physically. So in order for somebody to break into your account, they'd have to steal that key or steal that that fob to get into the account. So that makes it a little bit tougher. So uh, I'll give you an example of what I do. So. Um, I have the uh, Microsoft Authenticator on my phone. So when I log into Northampton, um, on the screen, it shows a number. I have to type that number in, and then I have to use my thumbprint to unlock it. So I've got, so that's that's something that I, you know, know and something that I have because it's my thumbprint. So I've got multiple factors. So it'd be very hard, even if somebody stole my phone, it would be very hard for them to use my phone to log in because they'd have to chop my thumb off to go with it. So So that makes it a little more difficult. Um, okay. So here's another, um, to me, very important way that you can protect yourself. Um, virtual private network. What is a VPN? A VPN encrypts your network connection and conceals your IP address. It works by creating a secure tunnel between your device and the internet. Um, some examples of VPNs would be Proton VPN, Private Internet Access, NordVPN. I'm sure you've heard these in YouTube ads. In, you know, if you've there's Nord's been doing a lot of commercials lately yes, as well. I've yeah. seen some of those on Surfshark. I've, I've heard all of those. Um, but why should you use one, and when when should you use one? If you're ever at a coffee shop and it's an you know open network, you know public Wi-Fi, um, that is an untrusted network. Um, your information could be um, intercepted or sniffed from other devices on that network that you're connecting to. If you use a VPN, all of the traffic that's going from, from your device to whether it's Wi-Fi or whatever router um, out to the internet, it's encased in a secure encrypted tunnel. 
So even if they did sniff that data or you know exfiltrate that data, they would have a really hard time breaking the encryption to actually see what's going on. Yeah. Um, it protects your data in transit, uh, protects against man in the middle, um, which is kind of what I explained there, and it enhances your privacy of your network activity. Yeah. To give you an example of a man in the middle attack, this happened occasionally. Um, for example, you go to the airport, you're waiting for your flight, and you, you hop on your computer, you see free airport Wi-Fi. It could be a legitimate, or it could be some somebody sitting next to you with their laptop set up with a fake SSID saying it's free airport Wi-Fi. You connect, but you connect to their computer, and then they pass it on to the real Wi-Fi. So everything that goes through the Wi-Fi goes through their computer, and they're grabbing any credentials. So you log in to check your bank account or check your credit card balance. Boom, they've got your credentials. So... Um, I'll tell you, I have a VPN. Um, if you don't want to do the monthly, um, there are, um, I can't remember where it was, uh, it was Humble Bundle or Honey or something like that. Sometimes those, um, those discount sites will offer something. So I got a um, five device VPN. Uh, I got a lifetime subscription. It cost me like, I think like 50 bucks. And I've got it for the rest of my life. So I can use up to five devices simultaneously on that. Um, and so I don't have to pay a monthly fee because the monthly fee, I think NordVPNs, isn't it like 20 bucks a month or something like that? Or uh, Probably a bit less. Maybe it is. Yeah, You'd so, have to check the pricing. Yeah. So if you plan on using it for a long period of time, look around for like a lifetime subscription um, and get something like that because then you don't have to pay every month. Yeah. Question about that. I use, um, mine happens to be McAfee because I'm using that right now. Um, when I go to Wawa to try and log in, it keeps coming back with an error. And what I discovered is if I turn off the VPN, then it will let me log in. Why would it do that? What's it doing? Um, I've seen that happen as well. Um, if there's some uh, Wi-Fi where they don't want you to use a VPN, I've seen that happen at like hotels that I'm staying at too, where it blocks it from, from using that. Um, I would say, you know, if something like that happens, like don't get online. <laughs> you know, don't open yourself up to that. I'm, I'm but, using my phone though, so I'm not connecting to their Wi-Fi. I'm connecting okay. on my phone. So are you using Wi-Fi or you're using cell phone? I'm using the cell phone, cell phone. but my cell phone has the the VPN, VPN even yeah. though it's huh. directly on the cell phone. That's interesting. And it, yeah. it does the same thing with my bank as well. I can't log on to my bank from my phone using, I'm not connected to a Wi-Fi, right. I'm just connecting on my phone. I wonder if they're blocking, because I've had that uh, happen at Target too. When you're at Target, um, if you don't get on their Wi-Fi, you get really bad cell signal in the store. So they like they kind of want you to log into their Wi-Fi. So I'm not sure if that's something they're doing to kind of force you through their system or not. So yeah, there, there are some services and some organizations that will not let you connect to their services while you're on a VPN. And it could, you know, some VPNs, you know, they, it might work with some VPNs. It might not work with others, um, but it. I just find it very odd because a VPN is supposed to give you security. So right. why are they taking away that security? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that may be. So yeah, weird. Um, okay, next one is physical. So physical cyber attacks use hardware, external storage, um, physical attacks to basically do the same thing as malware. Um, a lot of times, when I think of a physical cybersecurity attack, it could be something like uh, USB rubber ducky. Somebody will leave a malicious USB on you know the grounds outside yeah. in the parking lot. That, and, that's a really common, right? Yeah. Like you can get a, you can get dozens of these on Amazon. Put malware in all of them and toss them around the parking lot. Somebody's walking up. Oh, somebody dropped their USB drive. What are you going to do? First thing you do is plug it in, see if you can figure out whose it is. Boom, you're infected. Yep. So the, and basically, the the thing that differentiates a you a flash drive with a rubber ducky is it pretends to be a keyboard. So as soon as you plug it in, um, it's starting to type in commands. So that makes those very dangerous. Uh, why should you care? A lot of times, you know, physical cybersecurity threats are overlooked. They're difficult to identify and detect, um, difficult to remove in some cases. Um, Another one that I really think of is uh, if, if somebody had physical access to one of your devices, they could place a key logger, a hardware device, in between your keyboard and your um, you know, computer. Now, how many times do you get on the floor, look behind the computer to see if there's a, a piece of key logging hardware there? Yeah, especially if it's a desktop computer, yep. not a laptop. Yeah. 
Yeah, the, the key loggers look like so. If you have, if any of you have like a wireless mouse, you know what the little dongle looks like. They look exactly like that. So you just plug that into the back of the computer. It looks totally innocent, yes. but it's capturing every keystroke as you type. Exactly. Um, yeah, and it can do anything from installing ransomware, sending copies, or modifying system information, or dis dismantling networks. Yeah, and that's kind of an interesting point over here too. Is there's so many devices. There have been cases, I mean, if you do a YouTube search, you can find them, um, voting machines, um, ATMs. There's a lot of different devices that run computer systems that can be hijacked. As a matter of fact, there are some ATMs out there that are still running. The, the core OS is still like Windows XP or uh, Windows 95, just because, hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And so they're running really out of date software um, because they don't want to upgrade the software. Um, so um, I talk about that in class. Um, uh, giant stores, giant grocery stores used to have those little scanners you could scan um, to check the price. Um, I was able to break into one one time and it was running Windows XP. And this was only a couple of years ago. So, uh, you know, a, an operating system that's been out of date for 15 years and they're still running it. So that could be, you know, that's another vulnerability too, is companies that are not upgrading their operating systems because they figure, hey, you know, why would we want to spend millions of dollars to go to Windows 11? That's, yeah, that's why. Okay, so another really big one, especially I think for 2024, and you know, this I'm sure you've heard this a million times is AI. Um, AI, LLMs, and data privacy. What is it? Um, obviously, AI is artificial intelligence, but the core of that, generally speaking, when we talk about AI, is large language mo models. You're going forward. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, that's okay. Well, I, I can still talk to it if you want to go back. Yeah. But these large language models, um, while they make work for us and generating emails and typing up papers much easier, um, one of the things that you have to be very conscientious of is once you send data up to these um, services, that data is in the cloud now. It goes to that company, they store it, and they can use it as um, uh training material in their data sets. So if you're working on something that has confidential or private information and you send it up, that can, you know, you could be leaking data to those companies. If it's used in one of their training, you know, data sets, those records could be exposed to someone else if, if they know what models to push into uh, the LLM. Um, I think this is an issue not only for AI, but anything, any type of social media, they own your data. Yeah. So when you post private information on Facebook or Instagram, they own it. You have no rights to remove that. The exception would be the European Union passed the GDPR a couple of years ago, and any member of the European Union can say, I want you to remove all my data, and basically you have the right to disappear, uh, but we don't have that here in the U.S. So Facebook, Meta, um, you know, Google, they all own that data. Um, Chat GPT, those are all open, like OpenAI, Microsoft, Google, they're all working on their own versions of AI. And anytime you use it, any data you provide to it, they own that data. You can't remove it. Um, we've also seen, you know, these services used to create code um, for malicious acts. So they're also using them, the threat actors are also using them to craft better emails. Yeah. You've probably all seen those badly written emails. Like they obviously do not use it. English is not their first language. Well, they're using AI to craft better written emails to make it look more legitimate. Um, there's even something related to you've heard about deep fakes. There's even they're even using AI to try to duplicate somebody's voice. And so they'll you'll get a phone call from a, a relative saying that they're in jail and you need to send them money for you know bail and you could swear it was their voice. Well, they're just using AI to duplicate that information. They can do that pretty easily with just a small amount of sample data and generate the person the person's voice. Okay, favorite. You want to do this one? Sure. Yeah. So so who's heard of Kevin Mitnick? So Kevin Mitnick was a uh, very famous person. Um, he was an expert at social engineering. Um, he broke into a number of different facilities, um, NASA, um, government facilities, things like that, because he could smooth talk his way into anything. He had a very good knowledge of the phone system, and so he would call up and pretend to be a phone technician, and they would give him passwords and information that he shouldn't have had. So the idea behind this is you are really good at psychology. 
So think about the things that trigger people, fear and greed are like the two biggest ones. So you get an email saying the IRS is going to send the police to arrest you because you didn't pay your taxes, or you got a phone call, something you know similar, like I was talking about, like your relatives in jail, fear and greed trigger people. They act without thinking. And so they'll use that, that psychology against them, knowing that that person's going to do something they wouldn't normally do under, under regular circumstances. So the idea is that let me take advantage of that. The other thing is a, a term called catfishing. So um, you get these lonely older people. My um, my my wife's uncle is is one of those. His wife passed away, and he tells us once, "Well, I met this really wonderful lady online. Do you really know who this person is? It could be some dude in India typing stuff and you know pretending to be a you know a thirty something year old woman who's interested in him. You don't know. That's the point. Is you have no idea what they're doing." Um, so social media, um, you know, like I said, like phone conversations can all be duped. Um, they can all put in false information. And what they're trying to do is just get information from you. So there have been, uh, I can, I don't have any news articles on me, but I share those in my ethics class. Again, there are cases where people have literally paid thousands of dollars to these people thinking that, you know, hey, I can, you know, I, I won the lottery, I just have to pay the small fee and then another fee and another fee. Or, you know, this person's trying to be their boyfriend or girlfriend and, oh, I need some money and they send it and send it. So, and there was one I read recently in England, a woman, I think it was about $50,000 she ended up spending before she finally realized this is never going to happen and she's out the money. That money's gone. Um, and so you have to be very, very careful. I, that's even happened in my family. My aunt, who has uh, since passed away, um, she got a call that, like I was telling you, she got a call that was supposedly one of her her um, her nieces was in jail, and she um, wired money to get her out of jail. Not in jail. There was it was totally bogus, um, and she had no idea. So that was several thousand dollars that she wired that she's out. Western Union wires that money, and it's gone. So you have to be very very careful about these things because they know human nature and they take advantage of that. Any other thoughts you want to? Uh, no, just one that I see a lot of is they'll email. You know, you'll get an email. They'll spoof the email address to look like your boss or somebody important to you, and they'll say, "Hey, I need money for gift cards." That's a big one. Um, I, yeah, that's a business email compromise yeah. is a big one right now in businesses where you get an um, email from the boss saying, we have a new vendor, I want you to send set it up and send them $100,000 for this new, you know, invoice or whatever, it's all fake. Yeah. And and the, again, they didn't check. And then 30 days later, it comes back and they're like, why did you send this money? Well, the boss said I should. Pick up the phone. Hey, did you just send me this email about this new vendor? What's the procedure that I'm supposed to follow just to make sure that you're not doing something? Happens all the time where somebody is, you know, oh, I don't want to get fired. Boss told me to do it. Stop and ask a question. Call the person and say, is this legit before you do it? So, yep, phishing. Um, and we've talked a bunch about this already, but phishing is you, you, you basically get a fake message, an illegitimate email from somebody who is seemingly trusted. Um, a lot of times, again, they'll spoof the email address um, <clears throat> what you really need to be careful of is when you get an email that says, you know, Robert Fleming emailed you, hover over that email and make sure it's from the actual person, not um, random person 17 at gmail.com. You know, that's, you know, you, they can spoof the name, but it's really hard to spoof the email address. Same thing with the links, too. If there's a yeah. link in the email, if you hover over that. A lot of them use Amazon Web Services because they can spin up a server really quickly and then shut it down when they're done um, phishing somebody. So if it says like, you know, log into your account, you hover over and it says Amazon SW, you know, blah, 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 like this long string of information, it's probably a bogus server. It's not definitely not your bank account. Yep. Or they'll shorten it like bit.ly. Yeah, you know, you are all short yep. to, to kind of hide that. So here's an example of a phishing email. Um, yeah, like legitimate looking source, uh, not quite your work email .com. Um, Sometimes they'll change a few words around so it's still, or letters, so it still looks like, you know, Northampton, but instead of a T, there might be an L there. And a lot of times if you're not paying attention, it will look legitimate. And, you know, to what Brian was saying, the emails are, they're looking more and more legitimate. Um, the, you're, you're not running into the the phrasing mistakes or the mistakes in grammar or that 
that you said have all the time. Yeah. So on this one, the, I mean, a good good thing, you know, there's misspellings all over the place. Yeah. So that would be a clue. But like I said, if they used AI to, to do it grammatically correct, it's a lot harder to catch that. So hovering over the link, making sure that whoever sent that to you, call them and say, is this, is this correct? Before you actually click on a link. Swati, so this is a big one in, you know, uh, a lot of streamers will experience this, um, you know, big uh, YouTube, Twitch streamers. What is it? It's an attack centered around location sharing in which a bad actor calls the police claiming the victim has committed a crime. Um, it could be, you know, they could have, they could say there's a bomb threat, an armed intruder, a violent incident. Um, why should you care about this? This has physical and immediate consequences. Um, if somebody swats, let's say, your house, um, the police are going to come. They're going to, you know, kick open the door. Um, they're going to have their weapons drawn. You know, if the police are told, you know, hey, there's a, an armed person in this house and they want to, you know, hurt their whole family. Um, they're going to bust in and that puts you in a very dangerous situation. And, you know, a lot of times we do see this with a lot of people who stream um, somehow their geographic location or their address gets leaked. And, you know, they, somebody might do that as a joke, but it is a, it, it's not a joke. It's a very serious thing that can happen. Yeah. Um, that actually happened. The worst case scenario actually happened a while back. It was a year or two ago. Um, the police came in. They were told that there was an active shooter. They were pounding on the door. The guy wakes up in the middle of the night, grabs his gun, thinking someone's trying to break in, opens the door. The police saw a gun in his hand and shot him and killed him. Um, so that could be some just a, a, a case of, you know, like somebody um, sending wrong information. Um, so that's the worst case scenario is you get killed because you come to the door armed and, and the police think that you're the shooter. Okay, so other avenues of attack. What is it? Um... Internet of everything, IoT devices, we talked about that a bit. Any device connected to your network, any device connected to the internet at all, really, is, you know, anything that's connected, it's a vector of attack. Um, information collection, remote access, Bluetooth can be a vector of attack. Um, you're walking through uh, convention and you have Bluetooth and Wi-Fi on, those can be leveraged in some cases to attack your devices. Um, open ports, um, that kind of gets into the technicals of things, but certain ports that are open and exposed to the internet can be used to get into your device and install malware, take remote control, that kind of stuff. Um, your network can be used to attack someone else. We talked about that with botnets and they can be leveraged for DDoS or all sorts of other things, really. Any device that stores information or is connected to the internet can be vulnerable. Uh, assume that you are vulnerable um, and take measures to understand and mitigate those risks. We talked about mitigating those risks with um, keeping, well, always keep your devices as up-to-date as you can. Um, use anti-malware platforms. A lot of times when you pay for those for, uh, the versions of those, they'll do real-time monitoring and mitigate. You know, if they see an attack, they'll try to prevent it. And um, yeah, don't, don't be low-hanging fruit. Don't have short passwords. Don't leave your devices exposed with no protection on the internet. Um, anything else you want to touch upon there? That's good. How can you better protect yourself online? Um, Secure networks. Um, wireless routers are a way for cyber criminals to access your online devices. Obviously, um, routers, just like computers, uh, it's good to keep them up to date. Um, their companies, Netgear, um, TP-Link, they whatever router you're using, check to see if the firmware needs to be up to date. A lot of times they will package in security enhancements in those um, packages to make sure that your device is less susceptible to being exploited. Yeah, and I'd recommend staying away from the cheap Chinese routers. Like yeah. You go to Micro Center or Amazon, and you know, look, I can get the router for $15. No updates, they don't support it. Get a, a well-known Netgear, TP-Link, Ubiquity, some yeah. company out there that has a known history of updating security um, patches. Absolutely. Sometimes it really, really is worth paying just a little bit more getting a brand name product because you know that it's, you know, it's reputable. Um, if you connect it, protect it, um, update. Yeah, so let's, let me ask about that. You should have antivirus on all your devices. Okay, Macs are just as vulnerable as Windows these days. 
It wasn't in the past, but there's as Mac became more popular. It became a bigger target, and there is malware targeted at Macintosh computers. Your phone um, should have um, some kind of antivirus or malware. So any device that you connect should have some protection on it. So there are malicious apps on like the Google um, Play Store and the Apple. The app is a little bit more secure. Their Play Store is a little more secure. But Google, there's malicious apps out there that are gathering data. Um, if you don't have anything to stop it, then you could be a victim. Yeah. And I, I mean, it really is important to layer the defenses that you you have to protect yourself. It's not just software updates. You know, if, if software updates fail or they don't patch a vulnerability, you know, then it, it goes to whatever anti-malware platform you have on that device. Um, it's really important to have that layered approach. Um, double your login protection. Obviously, we talked about that. Enable multi-factor authentication. That one really does stop a lot of yeah. unauthorized access to your service. Yeah, if you have the chance to turn it on, um, do it. Yeah. Um, I've noticed that with um, um, where I, I live further south, but Jefferson Health, um, they have, they'll send me a text message when I log in now, or my bank will send me a message, or you can use your thumbprint to log on your phone. If they give you the opportunity to add extra security, it's worth it. Um, I tell my students a lot of times, security and convenience are kind of opposite ends. It's more convenient, it's probably less secure. So a little more security to protect you for a little less convenience is, is much better in the long run. Yeah, there's nothing convenient about having your accounts broken into and then used against you. Uh, password tips. Um, did you know credential stuffing is a cyber attack that tries to stuff already compromised usernames and passwords from one site into another? And again, we talked about that. That's why it's super important to have unique passwords because once you know that email address and that password is leaked on one website, they're going to take that information and try it across all sorts of other common websites that might be associated with your information. Yeah. To give an example, in, in my classes, we use a file called rocku.txt. It's a text file. It has 14 million known passwords. And we use that to try to break into systems to see if one of those passwords matches. There are larger ones out there. There have been all those data breaches that occur. They collect all those passwords and use those common passwords to try to break into other accounts. Because the likelihood is if somebody used that password on one account, they probably used it on another account. And that gets me into their other accounts. Absolutely. Um, you know, some of these it, use a mix of uppercase, lowercase letters, numbers, symbols. Um, that's It's good to do that, but sometimes that's really hard to remember. Um, a lot of times now what they're recommending is use a pass phrase, which could be, you know, uh, pineapple, Toyota, breadcrumbs, you know, something that you'll remember. Not that I expect you to remember that, but yeah, like you might do, do something, you know, create a phrase that will be unique to you. That is easy for you to remember. Yeah. Um, and the nice thing too, I mean, if so, some sites will require you to have like uppercase, lowercase and a symbol and a number, put like a dash between those three words. Exactly. And then maybe a number at the end or something like that. And that, then you're hitting all the check marks. You got uppercase, lowercase, number, symbol. Um, but it's a lot easier for you to remember that than it is, you know, Z, capital R, B, you know, like you're going to forget that immediately. Yep. Um, and yes, uh, use a password manager. Um, there's a lot of really good ones out there. Um, one password, LastPass, Bitwarden, those are really big ones. Um, there's a bunch of other ones, but Password managers really do have a lot of tools and functionality that one greatly enhances the security, but also one of the things that Brian was mentioning was when you have that kind of, when you add security, it limits convenience. This kind of blends both of those where you still have the convenience. Oh, you want to generate a password? It's really strong. It's 20 characters long of letters, numbers, and symbols. Um, sure, I'll do that. And then I'll also save it for this specific site. One of the other things I like about using a password manager is when you go to a website, um, it's looking at that website. So if you happen to go to a fake website that's not, it, it, it's meant to look like the website you really wanted to go to, that password manager is going to be like, uh, I don't actually have the password for this website. And that sometimes helps you take a double look at what you're trying to log into. It's like, wait, no, that, this isn't the site I'm trying to reach. Yeah, and they're pretty easy to use. Um, I have Bitwarden installed in my browser. So when I open up my browser, I log in one password that I remember, my master password. And from then on, any site I go to, it either auto fills in the information or I click the little Bitwarden symbol and it comes down and gives me a list of available passwords for that site. 
Um, it's really not that difficult. And then, you know, I've, I show this in class. I've got Bitwarden on my phone. I've got over 500 um, um, passwords on there. So I've got 500 different sites. Every one of them has a unique password. No one's ever going to be able to break into any other site, even if they get one of my passwords, because they're all unique. Sure. Yeah. Uh, when you use something like Bitwarden, it fills it in. It's not recording the keystrokes. If right. you're Correct. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's like a copy paste. Yeah. Instead of hitting the keyboard. So, so keylogger is not going to catch that. Yeah. But if it was a keylogger that was tracking keys that you're typing on a keyboard, that would basically render that ineffective. So to wrap up the idea here again, so we tried to give you some very practical um, examples and some ideas that you can use. Um, it's not hard to take the extra step, um, make that phone call or ask somebody to verify or you know, use a password manager, just take those extra steps to make yourself a little bit more secure. And that re reduces the amount of heartache later on when you get compromised. Because honestly, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Um, if any of you go to that Have I Been Pwned website, I guarantee any password you're using is probably part of a compromise in some way. Um, I could show you mine. I think I've got like a half a dozen compromises because I, you know, um, LastPass got compromised not long ago. LastFM got co uh, compromised with the FM streamer. Um, Dropbox got compromised. So there's all these sites out there that have been compromised. My email address was in there. So I'll immediately just change the password for that account so that I don't get compromised later. Absolutely. All right. I think that's, yeah, that's, I think that's it. So this, a lot of this information came from CISA.gov. They provide a lot of uh, materials for this and um, cybersecurity awareness month. Um, does anyone have any questions before we wrap up? Well, thank you all very yep, much for yep, really. uh, attending. Um, again, we recorded this via Zoom, so we'll distribute this. Um, we'll, uh, I'll post it to my YouTube channel so you can review it later on. But uh, thank you very much for coming out today. Place very much.